Hello, I'm Bernard Gersh from the Mayo Clinic, and with me today is uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Scott Wright. Scott is Professor of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic, major interest in preventive cardiology. And Scott, we're going to talk a bit about evolving strategies in lipid-lowering therapy. Welcome. Thank you very much, Bernard. Pleasure to be with you. So what are the new strategies? Um, I know uh, the statins, we don't have to talk about those. Azetamide is currently the subject of a trial. What are some of the new agents out there on the horizon? Well, if we think about the strategies that are evolving to lower LDL further, uh, there are two new classes of drugs that are being developed and tested in phase three clinical trials. The first is a drug called mypomersin. It's an antisense uh, compound that inhibits the message RNA from producing lipoprotein or apoprotein B. Apoprotein B is the protein that works with LDL to form the LDL particle. So if you make less ApoB, you have less li okay. LDL. You've got to keep it simple, Scott, for those <laughs> of us who are not lipidologists, but okay, I follow. So it blocks LDL synthesis, and it's an interesting strategy because it's an antisense uh, uh, oligotide, uh, which means that it blocks things at the message RNA level. Injectable? It's an injectable, right. and, and right now it's given weekly. And of course, that will be a whole new paradigm for our patients. I mean, we're going to move from preventive cardiology, perhaps, to interventional lipidology with these. The second okay. class of therapies are a series of antibodies called PCSK9 yes. antibodies. Now, PCSK9, Bernard, has been discovered, I think, since uh, the turn of the century, you know, just a few years ago. It is a, uh, a protein that causes the LDL receptor to be degraded or removed. So if you have fewer LDL receptors around to take out LDL, you have higher concentrations. No, no correct. This. So there, there are certain polymorphisms in which you either have a low or a high That's PCKS9. Right. That's right. But um, if you have it, you have a lifelong low LDL cholesterol level. That's right. And that has had, and, and, and they don't get coronary disease. That's Is that right. correct? That's correct. They get much lower levels. Now, are these people with high levels of PCKS9 or low? They have low levels because low we're, levels. we're injecting now antibodies to right. block the PCSK9 to keep it from taking away or degrading the LDL receptor. So basically, this is a great magical therapy that upregulates LDL receptors and removes LDL. So what is the preliminary data? Because they, uh, never mind the animal data, but preliminary clinical data. Well, the data really focuses on just lipid lowering. We don't have outcome studies yet. Those are being planned and executed. But both classes of therapy lower LDL between 30 and 50 percent. It's rather dramatic. Is it's, that on a background of statin therapy? It is. It is. And I think there are studies without statin showing it's comparable to that. So in many respects, you can bring the LDL down with a statin, and then if you don't get the LDL to the goal, you add a second agent. Now we use azetamibe or niacin. In the future, we may be able to add one of these injectables, which will uh, so, uh, do it even more effectively. So trying, I'm trying to think of the clinical scenarios. Obviously, one is uh, people don't tolerate the statin, or Correct. the statin is not lowering uh, yes. LDL sufficiently, or they get side effects. And, and, and certainly, I mean, I, I think in the last year, there have been a, an increasing number of reports of unwanted side effects from statins. Well, that's right. I mean, it the seems that... The myopathy biositis is more common than you think. Right, and also cognitive function, and, and there's some concern about developing diabetes if you're taking a potent statin, like a torvastatin, I think. Uh, but overall, I think it's safe to say for our patients that the benefits of statin generally yes. outweigh any of these risks. Yeah, but, and I, th I think that, that, I mean, that, that's really very important in regard to the diabetes message. I mean, there is, is this almost hysteria statins yes. called diabetes, but cause diabetes, but clearly the benefit outweighs the risks. But what about the scenario where you get the LDL down below 100 on a statin or below 70? Do you ever see these agents now coming in as to super lowest cholesterols, to super levels? LDLs of 30, uh, I'm I think very so. speculative. I think so. I think clinicians have been quite aggressive at lowering LDL. You can remember that we in our own practice were lowering LDLs to 70 before the guidelines recommended it. And in many of our patients who are either young with advanced atherosclerosis or people with multi-organ atherosclerosis, CVD, CAD, PVD, we try to drop the LDL to 50. To achieve that, though, you get a lot of statin intolerance. You get myalgias, you get muscle aches. People don't feel as well. So I think this will allow us to get a benefit from a statin and then to add to that without having to fully up titrate it. I think it's reasonable to say, or do you think it's reasonable to say, that lowering the LDL to 50 and 40 and 30, I mean, there isn't any 
evidence. We know there's that, no evidence. We know that pygmies in the jungles of the Congo have LDLs of 38, and yes. they don't get coronary disease. But we don't have any evidence that it's going to work clinically. I mean, that we have, have to be tried. We have no evidence, and we don't know in Western society if it really will work. And we also, many, including me, believe that the statins give benefit beyond LDL lowering. I mean, they clearly, at, at the molecular level, upregulate expressible nitric oxide synthase, and they do other things to promote vasodilatation and suppress inflammation. So I don't think we'll ever want to treat coronary patients without a statin. But I think there are many who can't get to goal, and so this class of therapy, these classes, will compete with azetamibe to be an add-on. Now for the second group, where the, uh, the incidence of this is really rising, statin intolerance, we only have niacin, azetamibe, and perhaps these injectables. And niacin has its intolerance issues. We don't know if azetamibe will provide a long-term outcome benefit. There's preliminary data suggesting it probably does, but we're waiting on the Improve It trial to, to show us and tell us. And if the Improve It trial fails to show a difference, there may be, you know, skepticism about the therapy, so it will be nice to have another class. And I'm glad to see the companies are testing these now in outcome-driven studies. Now, why injectable? Can, will they become oral agents? I don't think so. Really? I think the, uh, the uh, interases and other, you know, enzymes in the intestine would probably destroy the compounds because one really is, is an antisense, uh, you know, nucleotide that has to be picked up uh, in the bloodstream and delivered to the liver where it's exerting its effects. The other has to stimulate antibodies to PCSK9. It would be nice to have an oral one. I, what I think may happen is that somebody, some company, will likely come out with a once-a-month injectable. And I think that will be more palatable than a once-a-week injection. Yeah. I think, you know, if you look at the diabetic treatment regimens, many patients really are reluctant to go on insulin or to go on the GLP-1 agonist. And the GLP-1 agonists have wonderful data in terms of glycemic control and perhaps novel ways to inhibit atherosclerosis. But yet they're expensive and people don't want to take them because of the fear of injectables. And I think that will be true with, with these. Mm. I think it's also going to be a paradigm shift for cardiologists because you and I have been used to prescribing uh, uh, medications or referring them to the cath lab or the EP lab for procedures. Now we're going to become almost like our rheumatology colleagues where we're also going to be giving injectables. So that's a bit of a paradigm shift. So I, I, I think there's going to be a block in uptake both from cardiologists and <laughs> patients. <laughs> I think so, so too. Uh, during the last year, I mean the big or two, three years, the, the big, the sort of probably the hottest topic in preventive cardiology was HDL yes. elevation. And we've now had a few trials that are disappointing. Uh, the torcetrapib trial was uh, stopped because of probably secondary or hyperaldosteronism and yes. hypertension. We've had the defined trial of anisetrapib, which is promising, and now we have a very large trial. Yes. Ongoing, there's the delcetrapib that I know you can't comment on in detail, but we do know, uh, since you are, are the one of the principal investigators, but we do know that there's been an announcement that this drug has been discontinued. It has been. the development. So the HDL elevating hypothesis has taken a knock. It has. It has. I think uh, it's been very disappointing because AIM high was negative and the curves and that's were... That's the niacin trial. That's the niacin trial. The curves were superimposed and it's hard to argue that uh, the study was underpowered, although I know why people are arguing that and I understand that rationale. I think uh, we were very excited three or four years ago about the CETP class. We had three drugs beyond torcetrapib that were being tested or to be tested. A second one now has been stopped, and more will come out about that later on. Uh, and it was simply announced publicly that because of futility, it was stopped. And I think that's going to put a lot of pressure on the anisetrapib and evacetrapib studies. So, and, so uh, sort of great expectations, yes. but so far unmet. That's right. And there is one more niacin trial that Rory Collins is leading. Uh, and I'm hopeful that it will show a benefit because, you know, look, we all recognize that patients who have low HDLs have higher risks for cardiovascular disease, both for their first MI and recurrent MI. And we know that patients who undergo percutaneous revascularization and have low HDLs have higher recurrent risks. And, uh, I mean, I like to think that HDL is a player and a modulator. Some argue that it's simply a, a risk marker and we shouldn't mess with it. Uh, and I think the door is still open. It's been disappointing, but I'm holding out hope that one of the yeah, two... Yeah, I think it's premature to dispel the HDL yeah. elevating hypothesis. I suppose the key question is, I mean, we know epidemiologically that um, low levels of HDL are a very bad actor indeed. Yes. And certainly that high HDL levels in most populations appear to be protective. Yes. What we don't know is the HDL that is elevated pharmacologically is that the same HDL as is present endogenously, if I can use the term? That's right. Because functionally, they may be different. 
That's correct. And we also know that prior to statins, several trials with fibrate showed some clinical benefit. Yeah. The Helsinki Heart Study and the VA HDL intervention study. But currently, no trial which adds a second drug on top of a statin that's designed to exploit and raise HDL and perhaps lower LDL like niacin or simply raise HDL like a CETP inhibitor has shown a benefit, a clinical benefit. So maybe the statins are doing something to HDL that we can't add upon. Maybe pharmacologically we haven't found the right class of drugs to exploit it. And I think there's another hypothesis, and that is that LDL is a very simple, straightforward hypothesis. Mm -hmm. It delivers cholesterol and causes atherosclerosis. HDL has 100 to 1,000 functions in vivo one yeah. of which is reverse cholesterol transport. And there are different classes yeah. of HDL. And it may be that we're stimulating all of the classes instead of the wrong subtype to promote reverse cholesterol transport. So to sum up, a, a lot of interest in new agents for LDL lowering, very powerful. And, and very promising. Um, in the next few years and very promising. Unmet expectations with HDL, but the game is not over. It's not over, and I think my bottom line to clinicians and to patients are the following. One, treat the LDL, get it to goal. And two, work on non-pharmacologic ways to raise right. HDL, weight loss, better dietary management, exercise, and let's hope that one of the trials works. And, and of course, drinking red wine. Of course. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you, Bernard. Thanks.